from Millville, New Jersey, and reaching around the world. New Life World Outreach Ministries presents His Word of Power with Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join us in a time of joyful worship, anointed ministry, and dynamic preaching from one of our Sunday morning worship services. It happens here on His Word of Power. Up from the ashes, oh, up from the ashes, your love has brought us out of the darkness and into the light, lifting our sorrows and bearing our burdens and healing our hearts to our God. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice, singing hallelujah. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift, we lift up, up one voice, voice. singing hallelujah. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice, singing hallelujah. To our God we lift up one voice, to our God we lift up one song, to our God we lift up one voice. And His praise, and make His praise
You got your Bibles open to Matthew, the 14th chapter. I want to begin reading there at the 14th chapter. I'm sorry, 14th chapter at the 25th verse. We've been studying Peter walking on water. And so if you will look there with me at the 14th chapter, the 25th verse, as we read these words, and straightway Jesus can, I'm sorry, I'm way up there. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them saying, be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you today that your word is true, that, Lord, we can depend on your word and we activate your word. It helps us to overcome all the powers of darkness that come against us. So I rejoice today that your word is true, not only for everyone, but it's true in me. And Lord, because it's true in me, it is activated by the name of Jesus that overcomes all the obstacles that we face in life. So I thank you for what you've done for us, and I ask that you anoint the word that I'm about to speak, and let it be your words, not mine, your thoughts, not my thoughts, and above all, your intentions, not mine. So I thank you for that now in the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. We have learned so far some things about this fear. Jesus says to Peter and the disciples who are sitting in the boat, and according to uh, Pastor Wayne here, those guys in the boat were chicken liver yellow belly sap suckers. <laughs> and he'd rather be like Peter. Say, fear came upon them. And I want you to understand something. In every situation in your life, every situation you face, fear will try to take control. It is a spirit, and we have authority over those spirits. Somebody say our amen. So what we've got to realize is that fear comes against us to stop a supernatural event in our lives. And I don't know about you, but I like supernatural events. I like it when God steps in in the midst of impossible and makes it possible for me. Somebody say amen. Some of you right now in this building, this very moment, are facing impossible situations. It's only impossible to man, but with God all things are possible. And I want you to get a hold today that the promises that he has given to us, that he'll never leave us or forsake us, and he is our deliverer, are still intact and working on your behalf. Please say amen. Say it out loud, would you please? So I know you're alive this morning. So what we've got to realize and recognize is that fear is coming to stop a supernatural event in our lives. And so in order for us to stop that, we've got to have a reference point that our mind can lock hold of. Now, if we don't have a spiritual reference point in our lives, and we get those reference points from the Word of God and our relationship with the Father, if we don't have those, our mind defaults to natural points of reference. And natural points of reference are always points that will show us where we failed, where we fumbled, where we stumbled. And so what we've got to grasp hold of and get in our realm of knowledge and understanding is this, that when I read the Word of God, I am creating reference points in my life that I can go to that supersedes the reference points in the natural realm of life. And so I've got this supernatural reference point versus this carnal reference point. Carnal reference point says when you get cancer, you die. Spiritual reference point says by his stripes, I'm healed. Carnal reference point says no money in your pocket, you're broke. 
spiritual reference point says, but God meets all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And I know that his word says, I should take no thought for tomorrow because he already knows what I need. And so when I grasp these things and I create these spiritual reference points, they are places that I can go to when adversity and all the arrows of the wicked one are slung toward me. We have this system at home. In fact, I think we have it here on some of our computers and stuff. It's a backup system. And what it does is it creates in our computer these points. And it goes to these points. If something happens in your system, you can go to that backup point and restore your system. You know what a reference point that's created by the Word of God does for you? It restores your system. It restores your mentality. It restores your thinking. It restores your faith. It takes that which the enemy meant for your, be your evil and it turns it around for your good because it becomes a reference point that I can stand on and hold on to and not be overwhelmed by the situation that I'm facing. Come on, this is good preaching. That's why you got to have the Word in you. That's why you've got to have this thing tucked down deep into your heart. And you know what's amazing? You don't have to be real intelligent to do that. If you can read, you can create reference points. If you read this word every day and you faithfully just take it in, I don't care whether your mind's getting it or not. And if your mind's not getting it, you're reading the wrong Bible. Get a Bible you can understand. You know what? God did not just write the King James Bible. If a new international version works for you, great. When we're on vacation, my mind is on vacation. I cannot read King James when I'm on vacation. So I read a modern day English version Bible. It talks about you guys. You gotta be from New Jersey to know what use is. For those of you who are from the South, y'all. You got a reference point. See, what happens is when I read the Bible, and here's, here's the cool part, as I read the Word of God, whether my mind gets it or not, my spirit does. And I don't know about you, have you ever had this kind of experience? All of a sudden, you're doing battle with the enemy, and out of nowhere, this scripture rises up inside of you. Where did it come from? A reference point that you put in just simply by reading the Word of God. You read the Word of God. It put that in there. It stored it for that particular time that you needed to search out your database of reference points, and all of a sudden, it found it, and you're standing up there saying, oh, by his stripes I'm healed. Where'd that come from? It came from the reference point established by reading the Word of God. Somebody say amen. And I want you to understand something. Peter had no reference points up until this point of somebody walking on the water. But let me tell you something. From this day forward, he had a reference point that I walked on the water. Now, he may have sent, sunk, and all of us always going to go to the sinking part. Let's stay on the walking part. Because the walking part is the spiritual place. The sinking part is the natural carnal place. Watch this. As long as he kept his eye on the spiritual part, he walked on the water. And as long as he walked on the water, get this now, this is important. As long as he walked on the water, he was in the flow of God. See, your spiritual reference points keep you in the flow of God. <coughs> when the enemy comes against you, if you're in the flow of God, first thing that comes out of you is, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Why? Because you've got that reference point established in you. And it gives your mind a place to go to that will supersede the carnal reference points that you have established 
throughout your life. Every failure that you've ever had is recorded. It becomes a reference point. Every victory becomes a reference point. What has to happen in our lives is victories have to outweigh failures. And when that begins to happen, because we're concentrated more on our spiritual reference point than our carnal reference points, the flow of God is in our lives and life is good. Turn to your neighbor and tell them life is good. Tell somebody else life is good. And see, Peter was in the flow. He was in the flow with Jesus. He had stepped out into a new place, creating a new reference point for him. Now, here is what is going to happen. I'm sure that as Peter was walking on the water, because the Bible says, if we go on and read a little bit further in this passage, it says that he became aware of his surroundings. He became of the boisterous wind, of the waves that were lapping. He came out of the God-controlled environment that we've been talking about, and he came back into the natural realm. I'm going to tell you something. Every time you are in a place where you can either sink or swim, the devil is going to try to stop the flow of God in your life and bring you back down to his reality. But I want you to get this. His reality is not your reality. Your reality is you're a water walker. Your reality is you are the healed by the stripes of Jesus. Your reality is not his reality. Say amen. Because when he comes in, he'll always point to a natural reference point of failure. He'll always go back and say, look at you today. Look at the situation you're in. And you're in it because of, and he'll begin to point to past failures, mistakes, bad decisions, whatever it happens to be. And you know what that creates in you? Because this is his entire purpose. He wants to create despair. If he can get you into despair, you are one step away from discouragement. And if he can get you into discouragement, you are one step away from depression. And he'll take you down that slippery slope as fast as you're willing to go. And all you have to do is do nothing. All you have to do is let despair overwhelm you. And that's why it's so important for you to have the armor of God on to the point that the moment those thoughts of despair start overwhelming you, the first thing you say is, no, 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 not in this house. It ain't going to happen. God has given you a spiritual garbage disposal. God has granted to you the ability to take what the enemy brings against you to cause you to get into despair and to discouragement because the enemy is always trying to move you towards a reference point of the carnal realm and off the reference point of the spiritual. And so a thought comes to you. How many have ever had thoughts that are not God thoughts come to you? How many have ever had the enemy tell you all kinds of crazy stuff? Hello? How many have ever had this happen to you? You get a pain in your knee. Now, forget that you just bumped your knee. You get a pain in your knee, and the first thought that comes in your mind is you got cancer. Your heart skips a beat, and the first thing, you got heart problems. You cough a little bit, uh-oh, you got lung cancer. How many have ever had any of those thoughts? Am I the only one getting those thoughts? Then I must be the only one doing something for God. Now how many get those thoughts? Mm -hmm. See, these thoughts come to you. Here's the garbage disposal. You have two choices. You can take it in or you can spit it out. Your mouth becomes your spiritual garbage disposal of the thoughts that are trafficking in your mind. By what you say, in the power of the tongue is life and death. 
Hello? So I have the choice. Do I take what he's trying to feed me, what my mind is short-circuiting on, and accept it and allow it to germinate in me? Or do I dispose of it by the words of my mouth by saying, no, 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 not in my house. No, 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 not on the ground on which I walk. No, 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 no. I will not allow despair to lead me into discouragement, to lead me into depression, because if he can get me in there, he removes all hope from me. And if he can remove hope from me, I'm done. I'm dead. I'm all, it's over for me. Because the Bible says hope is the anchor of my soul. <coughs> hope is the anchor of my soul. See, people destroy themselves when they become hopeless. Once you get to the place in your life where you don't think there's any hope, there's no answers to this situation, you're never going to get out of this situation, and you become hopeless, you also become paralyzed. And where you are paralyzed, you have polluted the power. Did you get that? Wherever I'm paralyzed, if I'm fearful that every ache and pain in my body is some major disease, I am paralyzed in that area of my life. But the moment I begin to realize that I have power over that, somebody say amen. I love what Psalm 42, 242, 5 says, why are you so downcast? my soul. Why? 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 Because in me is something greater than my soul. See, in my soul, I've got all kinds of cardinal things going on. But in my spirit, it has been regenerated. And the moment I succumb to my spirit over my soul, over my will, over my intelligence, over my emotions, I begin to walk in the flow of God and despair and discouragement and hopelessness has no place in my life. Amen. Somebody say amen. And why does the enemy want you to become, or want to get you in despair, to lead you into discouragement, to take you down into depression? Because if he can get you to the place of hopelessness, you'll begin to make reckless decisions. And the moment you begin to make reckless decisions, you will pay it with it with your life. You may not die physically. You'll die spiritually. You'll die emotionally. You'll die in the areas of great importance to you as a human being here on the face of this earth. And you'll do that because he's got you to a place where there doesn't seem to be a solution to the situation that you find yourself. Am I talking to anybody today? Am I talking to anybody today? But I found out something. I found out that the Word of God said this. It's found in Acts 2.26. You may want to write that reference down. Acts. 226. It says this, my flesh, that's this thing, my flesh will live in hope. Wow. God just made provision for me to move from an all spiritual realm of hope into a carnal realm of hope and that my flesh does not have to give in to the hopeless situation that I have found myself. Is somebody with me this morning? And as long as God is in my life, what may seem impossible to me is not impossible to him. Therefore, because of that, whatever's coming against me, whatever is overwhelming me, whatever is frustrating me, whatever is aggravating me, whatever is causing anger, whatever is causing me, for the Italians, agita. I have hope. I can get up every morning 
and say, I don't know how God's going to do this, but somehow, some way, he's going to do this. Somebody say amen, please. Somehow, some way, he's going to do that. He's going to do this. 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 He's going to do it. Why is he going to do it? Because God is my final authority in everything. It's not over when the fat lady sings for me, brother. It's over when God says it's over. It starts when God says it starts. The door opens when God opens the door. The door stays shut when God says the door stays shut. When God says, I'm healed, I'm healed. When God says he meets my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus, how can I lose hope? How can I lose hope if I read from Matthew, the sixth chapter, and says, take no thought for tomorrow, because tomorrow will take care of itself. Don't worry. I know you need clothes. I know you need food. I know you need shelter. I got that under control for you. Just rest in me. Just rest in me. Just rest in me. Stop looking at your situation and start looking at your solution. See, you have a choice every day. Do you look at your situation or do you look at your solution? Your solution is Christ Jesus. Please say amen. And so when I realize and recognize that my flesh can live in hope, then I know hope won't disappoint me. How do I know that? Because I read over in Romans 5, 5, says hope does not disappoint. Wow. So it can look terrible. The situation that I'm in can overwhelm me to the point where I don't think there's any way out of this mess. I can look at the situation and wonder, how are you going to do this, God? I don't see any answers. I don't see any way. I don't see any possibilities. I, 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 I'm at the end of my rope. Nothing's working out. You don't seem to be answering me. You can't hear my prayers. I don't understand why all this is coming on me. I have no idea how I got in this situation. I have no idea when I've tried to serve you and follow you and walk with you and be obedient to the best of my ability. I have no idea how I got here. Now I don't know what to do. Now I don't know where to go. <laughs> For we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk by faith and not by by sight. Come on. For we walk by faith and not by Tell somebody that. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Come on, say it to somebody else. For we walk by faith and not by sight. For we walk So now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not. So now I have God's spiritual reference point. And whatever the enemy is trying to do, what I've learned to do in those kind of situations is don't be moved by what I see. Be moved by what I do believe. Amen. And having done everything that I know to do, stand still. I don't want to stand still. I don't like it here. Having done all to stand. No! 
I don't want to stay here. I don't like it here. I don't like what's going on. Ah, da, 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 da. You big baby. <laughs> Having done all to stand, you know what it means to stand? Having yourself gird about with the armor of God. Putting on the helmet of salvation. Putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Gird your loins with truth. <laughs> shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, picking up the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. Oh, but Pastor, I can't lift that sword. It's too heavy. Oh, you can't, poor baby. <laughs> if you can't lift it, God can. I said, if you can't lift it, God can. God can put it back in your hand. <coughs> <coughs> Somebody say amen, please. Amen. God can put it back in your hand. And then he can give you the strength in your arm to lift it up. Amen. Then he can give you the power to chop off the demon's head. Just like Goliath's head went rolling down the road. Hello? See? What the enemy is trying to do in your life with the situations that you find yourself, is he's trying to kill you. Oh, he's not trying to kill you physically. He doesn't care whether you're alive or dead. He's trying to kill your worth. He's, kind of, he's trying to kill your vision. He's trying to kill the God that's inside of you who is enabling, enabling you to do all things. He's trying to kill the vision, the very thing that God has declared in your DNA for you to achieve. And he does that through situations to bring you to a point of discouragement, despair, and depression so that he can steal your hope because if he steals your hope, he's paralyzed you. So what do I have to do? How do I... How, how do I transform myself out of this? I realize something. I settle something in my life. The devil, I want you to get this. This is really important. The devil does not care what you used to be. He only cares what you're about to become. I didn't steal that either. That's my own. <laughs> every attack, every situation you find yourself in is not against what you were. It's against what God is making you into. Amen. So every attack that he comes against me with only reassures me that there is something greater that God has for me in my life. It's not the end of who I am. It's the beginning of what I'm about to become. So every attack that the enemy comes against me is not in what I was, but what I'm going to become. So I know that when the situation looks entirely hopeless and the only thing that I know to do right now is stand. Now, here's the question. How do I stand, God? You know, what does it mean to stand? Do I walk around quoting scriptures? She didn't say, having done all, walk around quoting scriptures. He said, stand. So how do I stand? In Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the Bible says, we enter into his rest. Some of us haven't because we didn't add our faith and believe that there was a place of rest. <clears throat> so what we do when we stand, is we worship. Standing is not interceding. Standing is not memorizing scripture. Standing is not quoting scripture. 
standing is not getting all your spiritual friends around you to pray over you, <coughs> excuse me, and anoint you. Standing is lifting your hands up and worshiping him. Because standing is another word for trusting. And you only trust somebody when you get to the point where you can say, I don't understand this. I don't like it. I feel hopeless in this situation, but I trust you. I trust you. So I'm going to lift up my hands because I know the Word of God says, every time I lift up my hands, I'm lifting up my heart to you. So I'm lifting up my heart to you, and I'm saying, I don't like this. I don't know how I'm going to get out of it, but you do. So I'm going to just trust you by worshiping you and praising you and thanking you. And you know what? In the midst of your worst turmoil, in the midst of your despair, your discouragement, in the midst of your hopelessness, when you raise your hands up and just say, I worship you, Father, I thank you, Lord. This is the toughest place I've ever been in my life, but I love you, God. I love you, God. God looks down and says, look at that. Look at my child. He walking by faith. She's walking by faith. She's not moved by what's going on around her. I got to send the ministering angels down there. I got to send a whole army down there and take care of them. And just like I did for Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and I sent angels to minister to him, I'll send angels down to my worshiper. I'll send angels down to my believer who's standing on the Word of God. Oh! Open the windows of heaven. Oh, release the resources of my kingdom. Because they're saying, when they don't see anything else, they see me. See, when you don't see anything else, but you can see him, you okay. How many remember little buckwheat on the, our gang comment? Ote! I'm Ote! Huh? Little rascals, right? I'm Ote! You remember that? Ote! Ote, Spanky! Yeah. I'm Ote! See, I'm okay! I'm okay! I'm okay! I'm okay! I'm okay! I'm not lost my vision. Oh, I need, to, I need to teach you something here. This is brand new from the throne room of God, just inspired by the Holy Spirit. God's given me a vision. It doesn't matter what it is. To be a minister of God, to expand the church, to be a mother, to be a father, to be a great husband, to be a great wife, whatever the vision is. We're working towards the vision. I know the Bible says, <clears throat> without a vision, my people perish. Here's what happens to many of us. Are you all with me here so far? Okay. God gives us a vision. In that vision is the authority and the anointing to accomplish it. Everybody understand that? The moment that Jesus said to his disciples, get in the boat and go to the other side, he transferred the authority and the anointing for them to get in the boat and get to the other side, not stop halfway because there was a storm, <coughs> not stop halfway because he was walking to them on the water. He gave them the authority to get to the other side. Like the disciples, 
we begin to work on our vision. All of a sudden, all hell breaks loose and the vision gets clouded. And it no longer seems possible that we're going to be the best mom, the best father, uh, the, the greatest minister, whatever the vision that God's given you to be an author, to write a book or whatever. All of a sudden, the vision gets clouded. When you were writing your book, about halfway through, did the vision get clouded with all hell breaking loose? Probably every week. You wanted to just stop, right? Okay. Here's what most of us do. Let's say the vision is to write a book. We begin to write, the obstacles of life come against us. We get our time stolen. We were going to write tonight at 8 o'clock, and at 8 o'clock, the kids act up. You know, we were going to take tomorrow morning, we get called into work on our day off. Whatever begins to rob us. So what we do is we begin to shake off all that stuff and get refocused on the vision. So next week we're in the same battle, and the next week we're in the same battle, next week we're in the same battle, and eventually we say, this isn't worth it anymore. But pastor, the Bible says, without a vision, the people perish. The problem for most of us is we're looking at the wrong vision. We're looking at the carnal manifestation of the spiritual intentions of God for my life. So my vision is not writing that book. My vision is the author who's given me the inspiration to do the book. And so when the clouds start coming, and when I get to this place where it says, having done all to stand, stand, and I say, I'm going to worship you and I'm going to praise you, what you're doing is you're refocusing on the vision that never, ever changes. That vision of writing a book can change. Let me tell you that. That vision of being whatever you're supposed to be can be stopped dead cold in its track. But the vision of Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Father God as your Father, never changes. Don't get hung up on the earthly vision. Get your eyes on the eternal vision, and the earthly vision will do itself. And so when you're in a place where you're probably stuck and you're sitting there wondering, how am I going to get out of this mess? How is this going to be rectified? Get your vision back. Get your vision back. You remember the story of the men on the road to Emmaus? They were walking along the road to Emmaus after Jesus had died. They walking along, and all of a sudden, Jesus shows up and starts walking with them. He says, what are you talking about? And they say, well, Jesus was here. We thought he was the answer. We thought he was the Messiah, but the Jewish leaders killed him, and he's dead now. They lost their vision. They were now in a place where they were hopeless because he's dead. They don't even recognize that he's walking with them. Here's the interesting part. When they get to the house that they were going to stay in, the Bible said they constrained him to stay with them. He made like he was going on, and they constrained him. That means they drew him in and said, come. And when they're eating, all of a sudden their eyes got open, and they saw him. Up to that point, they didn't see him. Why? Because the earthly vision was lost when they put him off, took him off the cross and put him in the tomb, their earthly vision was lost. What he corrected and they were able to see him again is regardless of what happened here in the natural, the vision of salvation and eternal life never changed for you. And regardless of whatever it looked like here, know this is intact. 
I want you to grasp one last thing today. Their vision perished because the earthly manifestation of what they thought the vision was disappeared. When things in the natural disappear on you, when things in the natural don't work out the way you think they should work out, the heavenly vision is still intact. That's why you need these spiritual reference points. That's why you need these places. And if you'll pursue the purpose that God has implanted in your DNA, your destiny will be fulfilled regardless of what happens. God knows how to get you up over something. God knows how to get you around something. God knows how to bury you underneath something that's standing in your way. And if none of that works, God knows how to speak to it and move it out of the way for you. Your vision isn't on that. Your vision is, thank you, Lord. I worship you. I trust you. I long for you. See, because what happens when we get in despair, into discouragement, into depression, into hopelessness, our attitude changes. What we used to be able to endure, we can't do that anymore. What we used to be able to push ourselves to do, we can't do it anymore. What we used to be able to believe for, we can't do it. You and I have suffered pain. I don't have it anymore, but you and I have suffered pain for a lot of years. And in the midst of those trials and tribulations, sometimes, I don't know about you, but I just wanted to give up. Give me a shot, knock me out, and wake me up when it's all over. Was that you too? Sometimes you even begin to say, where are you, God? Other times you say, God, if you don't heal me, I don't know if I can go another day yet. Here I am. Why, because I'm some spiritual giant? No, because the same thing that will work for me will work for you. I don't know how many more days I can take this pain. I don't know how much more I can endure. I can't push very much more through this. And God, I don't even know if you're going to heal me because this whole thing seems irreversible. But I've learned that if I confess my faults to my heavenly Father, he is faithful to forgive me. And whatever mistakes I've made, whatever lack of faith I have, whatever stupid decisions that I've made, they are rendered powerless when I praise the Lord and give him thanksgiving because I'm transferring what I see into what he sees. And the moment I transfer into what he sees, victory is just around the corner for me. Bow your heads with me. Jesus. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Some of us right now are in situations that seem hopeless. Some of us right now are in the beginning stages of despair. Some of us have moved to discouragement. Some of us are on the verge of depression and maybe even one or two of us have stepped over the line. Some of us are here today. We don't know how it's going to change. We have no idea how it's going to be rectified. We've lost sight of the vision. We've done everything that we know how to do, but yet we find ourselves in this place. We are now at a place where we have to make a choice. And the choice has nothing to do with your own willpower 
because if it was your willpower to get you out, you'd already be out. So you are at a place right now where you're not sure what to do. And today's message spoke to you because you know now that you have to stand because that's all that's left to do is to stand. So if that's a situation in your home, in your health, on your job, in your company, in a relationship, in that place where you find yourself, we're going to pray. So if you're in one of those places and you're ready to do the only thing left to do and that's stand, would you slip a hand and hold it up in the air right now quickly? Thank you, thank you. If your hand is up right now, stand up, please. Because the Bible says stand. Having done all to stand, the situation can't be corrected by your own will. Maybe the doctors can't even do anything for you. The only thing you know to do right now is to stand. Some of you have even got to the point where your faith has wavered. You become unstable in all your ways. But this morning, right now, the simple act of standing now takes you to a brand new place. Having done all to stand, I command you to lift your hands and worship God right there where you are. Whether you believe, whether you've lost your faith, whether you're wavering, whatever, even if you don't know him right now, maybe you've never had a personal experience with him, just lift a hand up and worship him. Just lift a hand up and worship him. The rest of us, I want you to stay seated, but I want us all to sing because we're sing worshiping him. Where my trust is Come on, church. Now, if you're sitting next to somebody who is standing, I want you to stand with them. Put your arm on them. Put your arm around them. Tell them you're not alone. I'm standing with you from this moment forward. I'm standing in faith with you. Come on, right now, quickly. I don't want anybody here who has, is standing up to be by themselves. Jesus. Jesus. Haiti. Haiti. Come stand with her right there, back there. Come on, I want somebody standing with everybody who's up already. Come on, you're standing with them right now. You're standing, they're not alone. From this moment on, you're not alone. As you worship God, breakthroughs are yours right now. Come on, right now, this moment. This moment right now, breakthroughs for you because you're putting your trust in God right now. The very essence of trust is yours right now. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, you said when we don't know what to do, stand. You said when there's no answers on the horizon, stand. When there's nothing that we know to do, to stand. We stand and we worship you, Lord. We stand and we worship you, Lord. We stand and we worship you. <coughs> Your situation may not change by the time you get home today, but you've changed. You're now trusting in the everlasting arms of God the Father Almighty. Healing is yours. 
deliverance, freedom, confirmation. It's yours in Jesus' name. Hi, this is Pastor Myers. I wanted to let you know our church family would love to have you join us here in the sanctuary for one of our weekly services. Every Sunday morning we have dynamic worship, powerful preaching, an awesome children's church, and we see the power of God as he ministers to his family. Those services begin at 11 a.m. Then on Wednesday nights, we have ministries for the entire family. We have adult worship and Bible study, Royal Rangers for the boys and G3 for the girls. It's a night packed with the presence and power of God, and it happens at 7.15 every Wednesday evening. If you'd like more information about New Life Church, you can go to our website at newlifeoutreach.org. There you'll find all the information you need to be part of a great church. Well, until our family meets your family on our next broadcast, may God richly bless you and yours.